So, hey, Lorenzo, how are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm fine. It's a uh, it's a sunny day out in Oakland, and uh, I'll always say one of those. That's great. Yeah, we've got really nice weather here too, which is nice. We, uh, your your weather is generally nicer than ours is, but we, we're in that sweet spot in spring where it's you know it's kind of California esque, so it's really nice to be outside. Um, so, Lorenzo, could you go ahead and give us a, a short bio and just tell us what you're about? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, let's see. I spent the majority of my life as an audio engineer uh, making music, and then I got curious about the um, the way that the programs that you use to uh, create music work. And so that led me into software development and studying the, uh, the mathematical underpinnings of software languages is actually what made me realize that I, um, I was passionate about mathematics. And so once, once I realized that I actually like was capable of that, I was like, well, the, um, the, the barrier to doing physics, which was mathematics is no longer there. And so I'm, I'm curious about, uh, curious about going into that. And then, a few months later, uh, and in the um, the inner intellect, of, I posted about my interest in it, and someone reached out to me, and they were like, "Hey, you should read this. We should read this book called Lost in Math by Sabina Hassenfelder, and it's a conceptual um, layout of of modern physics." And that gave me the conceptual understanding that I could go and start um, piecing together with the mathematics. So you know, like uh, like um, something for 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 an example, like. Well, I don't want to get too too deep into like quantum mechanics and well, may, maybe for later in Hilbert spaces and, and states and all like that. But I was able to go map the mathematics onto the concepts. And so that has led to me, um, yeah, wanting to be a theoretical physicist. That's nice. great. And, and I love that. So you went from, I, I love how you kind of like kept digging like the layers deeper and deeper and deeper. So you went from music to, okay, like, I, so I'm making music, then I'm, I'm making music with software tools. And I'm like, well, like what's behind the software tools? And then, you know, what's behind the programming that makes the software tools? What's well, math? And then behind that, um, you know, is, is that something you've always been interested in? It's like kind of digging like that next layer deeper. Yes, yes. That's, that's kind of um, how my mind works. Like when I become interested in a thing, I always step back and think about that the thing that you're interested in is actually uh, composed of several other things and understanding those things deeply will allow you to be, uh, will allow you a deeper understanding of the thing that you're actually interested in. And so I always like to like dig deep and see what's going on under the hood and, you know, things usually get sanitized and, and cleaned up, but there's usually a lot of like interesting nuance and complexity and some disagreements under, under the hood. And that just, <clears throat> helps you appreciate the uh, appreciate the thing more. That's great. I, I really like that. So, so my, kind of my, my first question is is about mathematics. Can you talk about it a little bit? You know, like we all know what math is, but you know, I, I think there's a, a layer behind that. So, so what is math, and what makes it interesting? <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, the the interesting thing is that there's actually no concrete definition of what mathematics is, and there are some some sort of you know circular answers. You know, uh, mathematics is what mathematicians do, and <laughs> you know, I think there's there's one um, one answer that I was I saw leafing through PDFs and whatnot, which is that <clears throat> mathematics is the um, study of formal patterns patterns that can be uh, spoken about rigorously and, and, and logically, but even, even deeper than that, it, it's, it's just, um, and this goes to, you know, uh, Wigner's unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. There's this, this ability of this concept to map on to the physical world and our daily experiences in a way that it, it is, it is so applicable and accurate that um, mathematics is, is, you know, uh, just a bit, it's a bit mysterious as, as Wigner says. And so I think, um, I don't, I don't know if there is a solid definition of, of what mathematics is, but um, as, as far as why it's, why it's interesting, I think part of it for, for me is, is that mathematics can translate into physical theories that can describe not only the world we experience, but aspects of the world that we don't experience. You know, if you think about, um, mathematics that describe the gravitational pull of extremely large celestial objects or the way that uh, fundamental particles move and, 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 and decay. I th there's just, there's just so much, so much there. And so that's what, I think that's what makes it interesting for me. 
It's great. So maybe like just systematizing the world at some level is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got it. So, you know, it, it's fascinating. So I remember, you know, I, I went to a few math competitions in school and I remember taking math classes. I, I was never enamored with it at all. It always seemed like, you know, it's just like completely abstracted away from reality. And I'm like, why? And I'm a very like practical driven person. I'm very interested in like, you know, how do we manipulate the world? And, and it just seems so far away. It seems like uh, you kind of come full circle, right? So like you, you approach it from the angle of, okay, like, you know, audio, software, you know, then programming, then math. So you've kind of gone like... I, it's just really interesting to me how you've kind of gone like the other direction, if that makes sense. It's like you t- you went from like a practical element down back to the theoretical instead of like, we're just going to go straight to the theoretical, which I think maybe did, did that help like motivation wise, you know, were you ever interested in math in school? Like, what did that look like? Oh, no, I, I deeply despised mathematics in, in school. I, I absolutely hated it. I, I disliked it so much that I almost came close to a, uh, being quite quite mean to the math kids that did enjoy it and that's that's just downstream from the um the educational experience i had which i think improperly administered mathematics is this thing where you can just shuffle numbers around and be a pencil pushing number jockey and then you um you just you don't appreciate um, um what it what it can what it can be and so once I, I was I was studying the mathematics that underlie like programming languages like lambda calculus, I realized, oh, there's this whole other reality that exists under the concept of, of mathematics that is much uh, much richer and much more interesting and 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 creative um, than I think is is presented to um, to a lot of students. And so I was I was not always enamored with math, no. That's cool. I really like that. Um, do you have any like recommendations? Like, so if someone's trying to teach a kid mathematics and I know, uh, I have a friend, Mark Prinsky, he's, he's really against like, uh, he's all about this concept of empowerment. So like, you know, we want to help you solve your problems. How do we do that? Not, you know, go like learn this one thing, you know, what would you recommend if someone's like a, a math teacher, what, what's something practical they can do to try to make things uh, more interesting? Well, I, cause one of the, one of the things that, that pops to mind is, is I was reading um, a, a biography of Grisha Perlman. He, he did some great work with the Poincari conjecture and he, um, he came from a, a school in Russia where the teachers abandoned the idea that children are effectively not intelligent enough to appreciate abstract concepts. And so they threw the children right into topology. But if you oh, wow. break if you break that down, you're you're talking about sets of elements, groups of elements, and you can basically break down these high level things into bite-sized concepts that kids can take can take with them. And then they have a, a taste of the much more perhaps interesting mathematics. And I think exposing kids not just to like, you know, um, you know the things like you know, do rote memorization of your multiplication tables or, or things like that, you know, like I think giving kids a taste of the interesting things and then giving them something to work towards and in the process of working towards that, they'll even be able to appreciate, you know, just the, um, you know, this appreciate doing like simple mathematics because you start to think about well, like, what even is a number? What, what, you know, what really is this, is this thing, you know, that we can talk about four things, but the platonic concept of four is, is not in our physical reality. And so I think don't hide the, um, the interesting stuff, you know, give them something beyond, um, you know, just, you know, the rote calcula- calculations of elementary arithmetic. If, I think kids can handle more than that. And that's a, a, a great way to, I think teach mathematics. Lorenzo ma- music, which is another good example of a way to introduce people to, to math. That's what worked for you. That's what turns you and turns most people on. I mean, who's not turned on by music? Yeah. 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 Music is, is I'm, I'm actually, I'm rather comfortable saying that music is inherently um, mathematical. You have ratios, you have frequency, you have wavelengths. And so if you, you can, you can take a kid who's interested in music, who has no interest in, in mathematics and show them, Hey, when you're playing music, you are also doing mathematics and either 
the, the kid will like accept and be like, well, that's all, that's awesome. Or then they'll, they'll be like, no, I don't, I don't believe you. I don't buy it. And then you have the opportunity to blow their minds by proving it to them. And so yeah, music is, music is an, another great way to do so. That's great. So my next question is, is, you know, is your independent study an end in itself or are there, you know, are there hard goals you're pursuing as well outside of that? Um, I do have, I do have the hard, hard goal and, you know, definitely a hard goal of getting to the point where I could do a um, theoretical, theoretical physics. That is, that is the end goal, but it is also it, it, and, and into itself, I, I find mathematics to be enjoyable and, you know, relaxing and interesting. It gives me something to, something to, to think about. And I, I think that is, um, a perfect reason to study mathematics is, is you find it interesting without a particular goal. I think um, just increasing one's numeracy will allow one right. to be more comfortable in the world, more effective, make better decisions. And so I think there's, it is both an end in itself and there's also a, a concrete goal. That's great. That's great. And you mentioned Perlman. Did, was that book Perfect Rigor? Is that, is that, yes, what, yes. That, was, okay. that was, that was the book by Masha Gessen. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. I, I read it uh, a few years ago. I, did you have any, what, you know, what were the big takeaways for you from that? <clears throat> well, one of the, one of the big takeaways and one of the reasons that like I, I admire Perlman as, as a mathematician is his absolute sheer dedication <laughs> to his, to his craft. I Uncompromising. Really, um, yeah, I, I really uh, respect and admire that as, as a character trait. But I also one of the, the other big takeaways was, was that he was taught by very, very well skilled mathematicians who took a, a unique approach to um, teaching the mathematics to their students. You know, there's, there's a story in, there's a section in there about, you know, one of his teachers would take the classmates um, to go, to go, to go hiking and they would have them listen to classical music and et cetera, et cetera. And so I think this much more nuanced and unbounded um, type of teaching mathematics is, you know, it's not going to make every student Perlman, but if you want more Perlman's te teach more students like him, and then, you know, you might find that, you know, the flower will, will grow once you, you know, give the seed the proper soil. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I, I, I read on your blog, you, you were, you've been reading scientific freedom by Don Braidman, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know how far you've gotten into it, but do you think there is something to like, this concept of like uh, kind of like slack? So you know, you're giving researchers kind of free reign to go out, like you, you know, go out and explore and and find things versus kind of what we've got now, which is super objective driven and like um, kind of a, I, I think includes kind of the free pursuit of knowledge, which is how I think, unfortunately, I think you can't force the basic research very much. I think it's kind of something where people have to follow like the curiosity where it goes and then you get things like CRISPR and, and things like that, which, you know, you can't like, yeah, it would, it's difficult to imagine someone planning like how to discover CRISPR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think scientific freedom as, <clears throat> as a concept is, is key to, you know, doing, doing real, real science and what, what comes to mind when I <clears throat> think about like some of the reading I've done about, you know, like biographies of theoretical physicists, uh, Dirac and, and John, John Wheeler, one of the things that, that steps out is that they, that stands out is that they didn't have, you know, they didn't, they weren't being micromanaged. And so um, if there's, uh, what is the name of this Wheeler biography? Gian's uh, Black Holes and Quantum Foam. There's a section in there where him and Niels Bohr just spent like several hours um, in a library trying to find a better word for nuclear fission than, than fission because Niels Bohr didn't like it because, you know, you can't say a nucleus fishes. And so that's just, you know, there are these two great physicists who were certainly, you know, being well-funded and they were just, you know, goofing off. But the thing is, you have to allow for, for that kind of freedom. And one of, the, one of the, the other things that stands out from the Scientific Freedom book is the story of Max Planck, where he, he spent years just out in the wild doing science, chasing things down, trying to figure things out with, with no results. And then at the end of it, we get quantization and we 
we, we crack this whole new scientific frontier open. And when Planck was considering going into physics, you know, cause he, he made that discovery late in his life, I believe when he was going into physics, somebody actually told him like, yeah, don't do physics. Uh, physics is going to be finished soon. And so that's, I think that's just an example of like, you know, just don't box this thing in, give people room to, to go and explore. And that's how you actually get, you know, innovative discoveries. That's right. Yeah. It's, it took something like Max Planck, like 20 years to go with like thermodynamics. And it's almost unthinkable now for someone to work 20 years on the same problem. I, I, I do wonder, you know, to some extent, like the, the idiosyncratic people have all gotten like selected out of, you know, science and research. Do you think it's a real effect where people just, you know, they kind of get, you know, maybe the salesmen are, all, are all, the only people who become scientists now, the people that can win grants, you know, those are the people who become the scientists. It's not someone who's going to sit there and like, think about, you know, and not to say that this doesn't still happen, but it seems to happen much less frequently that someone that's, you know, very different, very idiosyncratic is going to spend 20 years, you know, on the same problem thinking about it. Uh, it doesn't seem to exist anymore. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I definitely think there's something to the idea that, you know, the, uh, excuse me, uh, the salesmen are, are certainly um, having a much better, better go of it. The people who can write the proposals and present them to a grant committee or, or some, something such that these people feel, you know, safe that their money will not be wasted on weird tinkering or that there will be some, you know, result that will probably immediately transfer to industry, which means somebody's um, bottom line, but I, I think that that definitely that I mean it doesn't um, in sound interesting to me to do, and I certainly can imagine that the people who are like, well, I have this weird idea that I want to follow, but I don't really have the patience for all of the bureaucracy and the social games that come with like peer review where the people reviewing your work are also competing for the same source of funding that you are. So I think that it's certainly drives a lot of people um, who, would, who would like to explore and do science away from it because there's an, in the, the idiosyncratic nature, I, I think part of it is an extreme seriousness and a low tolerance for like BS. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so people are just like, I don't, I don't want to do that. And they go off and do something else and, and we lose scientists. Right. Yeah. I, I worry, you know, Anton and I talked about this on our show a couple weeks ago, you know, we, we worry how much, um, you know, someone sees that happening. It's like, well, forget, forget academia. I'm going to go work as a trader. Cause at least I'm going to make money. You know what I mean? Like at least I can go make money in an algorithmic hedge fund, you know? Uh, yes. and, and, and that's, you know, I can go to Renaissance and, and make this huge amount of money and it, at least I have the money, you know, I'm still not able to do what I want to, but I'm not like shackled to this incredibly competitive fairy. This, you know, I, even in like medicine, you know, I have friends who are, are medical students and it's odd to me how the competition never seems to end. You know, it's like, okay, like it's competitive to get into the right college. It's competitive to get the right medical school and it's competitive to get the right residency and this competitive to get the right, you know, uh, fellowship. And it's just like, it's never, it seems to never end. And I, I wonder how much that just washes out people that aren't uh, completely committed to this idea of competition and, and winning these games, which, you know, if someone's really into your syncretic is not interested in at all. Yeah, I think that high level of, of competition strung out over the course of one's education and one's career gets in the way of, of collaboration, because if you're trying to compete at every level, then you you don't necessarily want to help someone with their problem because you might right. give them the key that helps them put together an idea. And now, you know, they've they've got it and you're still looking for a slot. <clears throat> and the, the same thing will happen with another person and you. And that's one of it's another thing that stands out in my reading about, you know, the uh, early history of quantum mechanics and, and the well, in the in the twentieth century, a lot of these people, you know, Einstein, Dirac, and, and von Neumann were like in in Princeton, and they were like they would, you, you know, this is probably an incorrect or contrived example, but like uh, Einstein would would have a problem, and well, no, him and him and von Neumann didn't quite speak a lot; they had uh, political differences. But yeah, Einstein would go to somebody like David Grossman and say, "Hey, like I've got this special this relativity theory, but like the mathematics." Um, behind it are, are, I don't, I don't quite get it. Cause you know, I, he was a, a physicist primarily. So he's like, can you help me out perhaps with the mathematical rigor? But if, if, if Einstein and, and Grossman and 
you know, or like Dirac and, and Heisenberg, they were competing, but they would also like, you know, help each other out and talk right. physically with each other. And so that if it, it's one of those things where like, if the greats did it and they made all these great landmark achievements, then, you know, perhaps we should not throw that baby out with the bathwater. Right. It's at least something to at least think about. Um, so you mentioned quantum mechanics. Can you talk about quantum mechanics a little bit and, and maybe the history as well? I, you know, I, it's a subject I, I know at the, the only highest level. Yeah. Yeah. Quant- uh, quantum mechanics. It is, it is interesting. So I guess the, if, and this is something I, I'm still learning and there's also, you know, there's still um, conflict in the physics community about, you know, the, the interpretation of quantum mechanics, what it really means or says about the physical world, as opposed to being able to um, apply the theory to uh, a problem and get some answer. But um, quantum mechanics seems to be about what happens at the um, the smallest scales, wherein you have uncertainty and things do not operate the way they they do in 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 the classical world. And a key part of this uncertainty comes from the uh, wave particle duality where particles also behave like waves. And, you know, this is sort of an example of how superposition pops up because, you know, a particle can be, um, a particle, a point mass can be specifically at one point in space. But if you have a wave throughout in space, well, it doesn't necessarily have a very specific uh, position that you can point to, but remember that this wave is part of the behavior of a particle. And so that gives us, um, that gives us some, that gives us superposition. And we have the, um, because of these uh, particles behaving like waves, we have constructive and destructive interference, which is, is, which works in a way that is is not at all like it does in the uh, in the macros in the macroscopic world, and so that's I guess let's see we got the uncertainty, the interference, and of course I I almost forgot the star the star of the show entanglement, which is a correlation between two physical objects or two properties of physical objects that is much stronger than anything that exists in in, in the classical world, and so a really a sort of a, a interesting example of of this is that if if you and a friend i have you and a friend in a room and i give one of you a salt packet and the other a pepper packet and you know these are the only two packets that i distributed amongst the two of you one of you can walk outside the room open your hand and you see the pepper packet and instantly without communicating with your friend you understand that they have the salt packet and if your friend opens up their hand they understand that they have the salt packet and thus you have the pepper packet and so this is this is, um, that's a, 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 a example, but um, and this exists in the, in the physical world with two, you know, two fundamental particles, you can, you can exhibit this. And one of the, the key issues with it is that this information transfers, so to speak, this, uh, this thing, it takes place um, instantaneously, which is obviously faster than the speed of light, which is not supposed to be, um, you're not supposed to be able to supersede that. And so it's, it's, just this completely quirky, strange, intuitive property. But um, as Richard Feynman said, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, nature works in an absurd way. So if you want to understand nature, you have to accept this absurdity. And so, yeah, it's um, it's fascinating though. And, and really- the other thing I, I read trying to get ready to talk to you, Lorenzo, is that if you, through the mail, sent Will one packet and you sent me the other packet, and I took my packet and I flew out to see you all the way across the country. And we both opened our packets up. We would know immediately what the other one was. And that's a great example of how entanglement works at very large distances. Yes, that's a great one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I guess what I'm taking away is really weird things happen when things get really small. Mm-hmm. Very. Is that a fair? Very, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an extremely fair one. Gotcha. That, that, that's fascinating. Uh, and, and so the, the big, you know, technology people have been talking about related to quantum mechanics is quantum computing. This idea that, you know, we can do, you know, have, it, it seems to be much more processing power and do some really interesting things with that. Um, do you, you know, how close is that to being operational reality? I don't know if you have any, any bearing or, or read much about that, but I, I'm just curious. <laughs> so yeah, qu- I mean, I guess quantum computers I- exist. You know, like IBM has a seventeen qubit um, quantum computer, and you can use you know the properties of uh, interference, entanglement, and superposition in order to do 
computation, like you said, that we can't do classically, where like, you know, the spin of an electron being up or down can be treated as a bit where up is one and, and down is zero. But um, it's, it's, I know there's just certainly a lot of, uh, of hype growing around uh, quantum computing. And I get, I think that's from, you know, the people's assumption that, you know, in, in five years, we will have something akin to a commercial quantum computer. And I think that's, that's a tad bit um, uh, eager just because we're dealing with like nature at, at the fundamental level. And we, we don't have really any say on when nature decides to give us a new, a new secret. Nature does that as she pleases. And so <clears throat> we're currently in this, in this area where um, we can, we can do computation on, on these quantum, um, these quantum bits, but the uh, system is, is noisy, which is a particular problem because these, the states of these, um, these um, quantum bits are very, very um, fragile and they easily interact with um, ambient um, electromagnetic fields, just things that exist in physical reality that are, don't have maybe visual uh, corollaries, even though magnetic fields can <clears throat> have physical effects as you would see with the, um, with the shavings of, of, of iron around around some magnet on a, on a table. And so um, I think we will probably in, in, you know, the next five years just see sort of, not to, not to be disrespectful, but maybe like 10% in improvements in quantum gotcha. computing where they will be able to use them to better um, analyze physical systems at the quantum level. But I think, you know, not like, um, what is the term, NISC? Uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum computing. I think we're still maybe 10 to 15 um, years away from like having clean, um, entirely fault tolerant uh, quantum computers. And it might be longer than that. And I, this, this just stems from the fact that like, this is a, an application of quantum mechanics and this is, it's tricky. It's, you know, it's not exactly forgiving and, you know, it, it just, it takes a lot of resources, but um yeah, I get, yeah, that's that's what I've got for that. Yeah, that that's interesting. It does seem like, not that it's this is impossible, but it, it seems hard. Like when we're still trying to figure out how everything works to build like practical applications on top of. Although that's not necessarily a prerequisite making things that work work. But um, uh, understanding, but that, that's that's quite interesting. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about time. Can you talk about time for a minute? I know you've written some blog posts on that and I, I'm just curious some thoughts about you, time that, that people might misunderstand or not, not readily think about. Yeah. Um, so what, what's, what's interesting, I, I think time is one of the um, frontiers of physics that will, that, you know, maybe the, the last standing because it's, it's, it's so integral to our experience that it's hard for us to sort of, step out of it and, and observe, observe it, which is we're usually so uh, beholden to it. And time has probably um, it in terms of like a, in physics, a physical system, time stops, reverses or advances the action, but it, it doesn't um, do a whole lot more than that. And that's, you know, partially because we don't entirely understand it where time is, is, um, it does not, um, you know, like classical mechanics will tell you things are reversible. However, time just seems to um, only work in one way. And that's just, that's a big mystery. And that's tied up with ent entropy and, and thermodynamics. And um, especially also at the, also at the quantum scale time, even, even gets, gets even weirder where there's this physicists have to sort of superimpose a time on top of the, uh, the quantum scale and, you know, they call it a quasi classical time because, you know, you can think about it classically, but you have to, you know, uh, factor in the fact that quantum mechanics is not a classical theory. And so there are some assumptions you can't, um, you can't make uh, about it. And yeah, it, it is, it is absolutely, um, it is absolutely uh, uh, a very strange and, and interesting thing. So I, I would definitely say I, I come away from this with the understanding that time is like still a very, very large mystery. And it's a, it's a very important, um, very important mystery too. 
Excellent. No, that, that's really interesting. Just to even like think it's like there, there's still areas that are very fundamental to reality. We just don't, we don't understand very much about, which is, it's just cool. It's cool to know. It's the sense that like, uh, you know, there's, there's many more things for us to go out there and try and understand. Do, do you have a sense that, that a, a lot of people think, you know, progress has slowed since like the seventies in, in technology. And, and one of the explanations for that is that the low hanging fruit has been picked. So all the easy things we've, we've grabbed all those. Do you have a sense that that is um, fair? Do you think that's a fair assessment or do you think there's still plenty of things out there to be discovered? Um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm in a super position of, of both answers. I, I will say um, I do think progress has, has slowed um, since the seventies. And this is sort of um this is just a, an idea that I've heard from a lot of people that I, that, that you watch um, um, the, um, you know, like the game B community, um, Schmankton Berger, Jordan Hall, Eric, um, Eric um, Weinstein. Um, <clears throat> these are, these are people that have, that have mentioned this before. I do think progress has slowed, but I don't think it's because all of the low hanging fruit have been, has been, you know, picked. I think, <clears throat> the um and this is a, a you know an, an interesting metaphor that I'm gonna you know paraphrase and borrow from Eric Weinstein is that we're in an orchard and we've plucked all the low hanging fruit perhaps from this one tree but we're so focused on this tree that we don't realize that we are in a, we are in an orchard and so I do think you know for instance the you know like the dogma in, in academia about what you know how physics should be done what the theories that people should be studying and working towards are and even in even in you know, other areas of science, I think the, 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 the lack of scientific freedom is the reason partially for, I think, the lack of progress. If people, you know, could get, you know, like freedom and funding without all of the, you know, intricacies and niceties that have to come along with it, I think we would, we would certainly see um, some new discoveries and, um, there's, for instance, um, it's like CERN, CERN was slamming particles together a couple of weeks back and there was an, an odd interaction between two, um, two, an odd particle interaction. And so if you <clears throat> check out the, uh, the lepto quark, L-E-P-T-O-Q-U-A-R-K, that's something that happened at CERN. And it was like, well, we don't, we don't have the, the physics to describe this. And then there's also... Um, so there, the particles come in in uh, partially the standard model three generations, and so the uh, electron has three generations. The electron and then the tau, the tau on or the tau particle is a bit bigger, and then the muon is the biggest. And they just recently observed some odd behavior with the uh, with the muon that um, might very well indicate additionally new physics outside of the um, standard model. But the interesting thing about the lepto quark thing is that um, electrons are are leptons, and so there's <clears throat> these two sort of different things that just happened recently in new physics that involve you know the same thing to some degree, but we don't have explanations for for either of it. And so I think there's I think there's still plenty of of you know low or even even mid hanging fruit that we could we could get to, but I don't think we you know exhausted everything but you know the star at the top of the christmas tree i think there's there's still much more to uh, be found makes sense so maybe we've just gotten kind of my uh, and we're just looking in the we're just not looking in the right place mm -hmm. um yeah so I, I i wanted to move on a little bit and uh are you down for a round of overrated and underrated <laughs> yeah I'm, def I'm down for that i'm down for that cool awesome so just i'll, I'll throw a term out and you tell me if it's overrated or underrated and why um so the first one is lambda school overrated underrated um that's a that's a that's a difficult one i think i'm actually going to take the politically correct answer and say that's equally equally rated because i didn't i didn't uh complete the program in the sense of going off to be a software engineer i got diverted by by other things but it if it I don't think if it wasn't for that, that program, um, they encouraged you to dig and explore and learn as much as you can and want to. And so that's how I found myself studying um, mathematics. And so I think that's, um, you know, that going there was, was very key in, in me getting here, but um, also just in terms of new, I think, new ways of doing education, new ways of assessing what people are, are capable of, you know, Landa removes a lot of the um, 
assumptions that you have about whether or not a person from such and such background is capable of, of, of doing, um, doing certain things. And so I definitely, I think, I think um, I got, there's a, there's a lot of, of, of good things going on there. And I suspect that as, as time goes on, we will see not only Lambda sort of expand and, and, and grow, but we will see a lot of places um, sort of mock the, the, the model and sort of take that. A lot of places have already sort of extended that and sort of borrowed the ISA thing. So yeah, I'm, I can't say anything bad about new educational institutions. We need, we need quite a few of those. Right. Uh, I'm definitely with you. It, it was, uh, it was surreal to me. I've hired a couple of Lambda engineers and um, that excellent, you know, they, I, I think I, they've all been really excellent. And the, the one thing I will say is I, I went to the university of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I guarantee you there's no one at UNC Chapel Hill that would keep calling me and try to beat down the door to try to get me a job somewhere. And I, yeah. you know, and they had people, you know, the, the recruiter, you know, she's calling me every day. She's emailing me and I'm like, man, you know, they, uh, that the power of incentives is is incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they certain that's that's if, if there's anything that I think separates Lambda from other institutions and gives them an edge is that they have aligned the incentives in a way such that people are are people who work at the school, the career coaches, the teachers, they are incentivized to sort of um, do whatever they can to, to help the student as opposed to, you know, in the traditional university system, you've already paid for the classes, buddy. If you if get out of here, <laughs> you can come back. And, you know, I think the funniest thing to me is they send me an email like, yeah, you can come back to career coaching once, you know, after you've graduated. Right. It's just, uh, mm -hmm. it's hilarious. Right. It, it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it's completely different. Um, that's good. That's good. Uh, so Don Braven overrated, underrated. Uh, underrated in, in, in my opinion. And this, this comes from, you know, reading, reading his book and think his, his ideas such as the A patron prize or the venture university. And then, um, just recently he, he, um, um, Anna, the founder of the inner intellect and Anton hosted a, um, a, a talk with him and he was explaining how like he's had these ideas about how we could do new research and new education for 30 years and he's been going around trying to get universities billionaires companies with millions and billions of dollars to just put together a program like this and the thing about it is is he has experience doing this at bp where i believe bp put forward was it it was a number of million millions of dollars somewhere between 20 and 40 but they got over a billion back and so the return on investment is quite obviously there but like he has not been able to um get a large number of people to to take him up on this offer which to me seem which to me indicates that his uh, his perspective and, and experience are being underrated by a um, quite a large number of people definitely yeah we talked to don on the podcast uh couple of months ago and you know he's 84 and he's super sharp and you know really kind guy and and i was left with the same impression man it feels like this 20 dollar bill just left on the sidewalk people just keep walking past I'm like man somebody pick that up <laughs> patrick collinson if you're listening man pick that bill up <laughs> yeah please do <laughs> go spend it <laughs> exactly um inner intellect overrated underrated what is it oh yeah the, just so the, the listeners know definitely um underrated because I don't I don't think that it's even it's it's still so much um it's it's going to be in like 15 years it's going to be a lot more than um I think people really realize but it's it's a it's an interesting thing where there's it's a community of intelligent passionate open-minded um warm-hearted people who are just willing to you know, just talk to other people about some of anything, sort of open their open their minds to things and work together and collaborate on interesting things, new ideas, and just a new way to have like intellectual conversation without some of the um, some of the perhaps ivory tower stigma that's a, 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 a t typically attached to the term um, intellectual. And so, um, yeah, no, it's it's like that's that's a community where I. I met a guy who was in India, by the way. So like, we're like 13 and a half hours apart, but he's like, Hey, let's read the book, read this book together. And so we, we, we made that happen. And so it's, it's a, it's a great place for um, hybridization and synchronicity and a, a lot of, a lot of things are going to come out of it. I think. 
It's really cool. I, I think it's, it's going to be big, uh, even bigger than it is now. Uh, Feynman, overrated, underrated? Yes. And so um, what, what, where I think, um, I think, which, which one of these do I want to want to tackle, tackle first? So I, Feynman always gets presented as this sort of every man individual, you know, right. like the sort of like normal guy who, you know, <laughs> casually was conversing with Dirac about quantum electrodynamics while being, you know, and also being advised by, you know, John Wheeler, you know, just, you know, casual. Yeah. Know, yeah. Anything. So I think given Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he is, he is underrated in that sense that like, I think he was like, fiercely fiercely in, intelligent you know and um so i think he was underrated in 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 that sense but i think you know um that's the same sense in which he you know might be overrated because you know he wasn't just this insanely brilliant um physicist who you know helped solve um solve um, a problem in, in quantum electrodynamics and I mean, he, he worked with plenty of the greats. And so, um, but, you know, he was, he was, you know, an, an enjoyable person to talk to. It seems he had a sense of humor. He was doing pranks on people at Los Alamos while they were, you know, working on the atomic bomb. And so he's, he's this, he's this interesting, interesting character who was almost like polarized just by both aspects of his, of his personality. So I think Feynman is both overrated and, and underrated. And I think that's a, that's a good place to be though. You know, like you, can, yeah. you, you know. definitely. Yeah. It's definitely good. good. Good to be both in certain circumstances. It depends where you are. Um, Lorenzo, I, I really want to thank you for coming on. I've got two last questions for you. Um, the first is, you know, do you have any parting shots? Do you have anything that you'd like to leave with the listeners that, that might be valuable and then where can people find you? Uh, anything that I would I would like to leave leave with the the listeners. Well, most most certainly, if there is anybody who is turned away from mathematics and physics is something that they um they can't do or aren't smart enough to do, I would really suggest that they um, at least you know check out. Now, I mean, part of this is you want to have some you know understanding of like maybe trigonometry and algebra, but even I I don't have that entirely you know entirely stitched up i think if for instance i i really got a lot from uh, leonard suskind's lectures and the associated books and then uh jacob schwichtenberg he's got the no nonsense um no what is no nonsense quantum mechanics uh, electrodynamics i think if um if if you if you feel like you don't have what it takes i would suggest that you try again with certain uh materials because there's really this thing about you know like weed out classes in college if you don't immediately display aptitude that you don't have what it takes but i i literally like truly i don't use the term despise lightly like i just and you know i was a musician so i was a creative you know like i right. dealt with poetry and lyrics like that wasn't my thing and so like now here i am you know reading a direct textbook because the proper uh, the proper materials i think will illuminate a lot of just the, the darkness that people find themselves stabbing, stabbing around in. So um, give it a second, a second try. And um, yeah, as far as where you can find me, you can find me on Twitter at um, Ket Renzo, K-E-T-R-E-N-Z-O. And if you're one of these people who has that, that feeling, like just shoot me a DM and we can try and put together some materials or just something, something small enough for you, for you to see that like, oh, I can understand this piece. But then, all right, so maybe I can understand this piece. And then maybe we go on to a bigger piece. And that's that's how it starts. Well, Lorenzo, I, I really like that. I, I really like that because I, I think it, it's weird. I, I think um, American society, maybe the West in general, I don't know. But it, we've gotten really bad about talking people out of their good ideas. You know, it's like, oh, don't go do that. Don't go do that. You know, avoid that. You know, I, my favorite. So I mentioned Mark Prinsky. He came up with the term digital native. Um, and I was talking to him on the podcast and he said, you know, kids will come to him and they'll say, and he'll ask him, what, what do you want to be? And they'll say, well, I want to play in the NBA. And he said, most people, most teachers just go, well, don't do that go to something else. But he says, you know, kids will often say they want to play in the NBA 
because they won't. May, maybe it's not that they want to play in the NBA. Maybe they don't want to play ba- be a basketball player. Maybe they want a lot of money, or maybe they want to be famous, or they want something else. Um, and, and they teachers often don't ask the next question, like, okay, like, well, what are you trying to get out of that, right? Because maybe you are just trying to be a basketball player, and maybe if you don't have the basketball skill, that's not for you. But oftentimes, there's like something else. And kids just, or even just people in general, don't have good words to put around like what they actually want. Um, but yeah, I, I really like that because, um, yeah, I think we should be we should be less reticent to kind of try and talk people out of what they want to do, and like yeah, you know definitely. beat them down with a hammer. That's just like that seems like a bad idea. I don't know. Definitely, yeah, we try too much to make people fit into this this mold, and there's no. There's no mode that works for everybody and, and thus all modes are useless. Well, I, I should, I shouldn't say that some of them work for some people, you know, but uh, by and large, I think we should, you know, give people, you know, some, the benefit of the doubt, like you said, so, all right, why, why do you want to be an NBA player? What do you want from it? What team would you play for? Right. You do offense? You, what's your, what's, what do you think you're good at? What do you, you know, explore, explore the idea that the child has and then you will help them, get a, a much greater understanding of what they actually desire. And that's, that's really good. That's good teaching. That's, that's good teaching. Definitely. That's cool. Well, Lorenzo, thanks so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Anytime. Thanks for your time, Lorenzo. Quite welcome. Quite welcome.